Good afternoon and welcome to the Circuit Economy Platform of the Americas. Day two, afternoon. We're going to talk today about financing circular innovation and research and development. And around the table with me, I have three great experts and I also have a, a, a fourth person on live stream who I hope we can get to momentarily. I'd like to start by introducing Nicholas Guarin from CryptoPublica.co here in Colombia to add Octavio Torres from La Lopez and also Claudia Lorena Garcia, who's the director of programs in the Circular Economy Platform of the Americas. My name is Ken Alston. I'm the senior advisor to the Platform of the Americas and co-founder of Circularity Edge, a consulting firm on circular economy uh, in the United States. Yesterday in the morning session that I moderated, we heard from Ken Webster, who was talking about uh, finances, and he was mentioning how the global initiatives uh, are not aligned, uh, the global incentives, I apologize, but global incentives are not aligned, and uh, also the regulations are not yet aligned in, in countries and globally to help promote the circular economy. So this is possibly one of the themes we can talk around at the table here uh, later this afternoon. Uh, and in my closing remarks yesterday, I talked about how the concepts of things like sustainable development, circular economy, are simple. And this is, of course, important so that we can get the mind shift that's needed of thinking about a, a whole new way of doing things. But when we come to realize it in practice and go to implementation, it's a lot more difficult because the world is a much more complex place. And so we have to look for different enablers, different levers that we can pull to try and uh, help promote and move things in the direction we want. And so we'll also explore some of these things this afternoon. Uh, finance is clearly one. Money makes the world go around, as the song goes. Um, but people and customers and their behaviors, how they deal with new things, that's another enabler. And then, of course, education, people understanding some of these new new things so that they can choose to move on a new new path. And, of course, then the, the regulatory frameworks, which can help uh, drive companies to move in these new directions. And yesterday, in my remarks, I talked about the five new circular business models. And so maybe, again, we can use, use these as another framing mechanism for our discussion around the table. Uh, the five models are circular supplies. So yesterday we were talking about chemicals and materials. What should we be choosing so that we can have materials that flow safely in a technical or biological cycle? A resource recovery, how do we get things back when we're finished using with them so that they can be reutilized? And the third one is product use extension. How do we get more use time out of the things we already have. So instead of throwing things away, can we repair them? Can we remanufacture them? And again, to reduce the burden on, on the environment. Uh, an important one that I hope we will get back to shortly is also the fourth one, the sharing economy, where there are many things already existing, many assets within a city that are not fully utilized may not even be utilized at all. It could be something you bought that is in a cupboard or a, a back room somewhere uh, in a business, and it's unproductive. So how can we get value from these underused or unused assets? And uh, so we're going to be launching today a new platform here in the city of Medellin for asset sharing for businesses across the city. It's a very exciting new development. It's online right now, and um, I'm hoping if I technology wizards will, will, uh, will, and the technology gods will be with us, that we'll be able to demonstrate it for you. And then the last one is, is the idea of having products as a service. Uh, here on the desk in front of me, I have my cell phone, which I purchased. I now own the molecules of this phone, whether I want to or not, when really I only want to use it to make calls, to use apps, and why do I have to own it? So the idea of instead of buying a product, I could have a service that again is another another change in a business model that can change the relationship with the ownership of those molecules. So maybe Apple or Samsung or whoever's phone you have will pay more attention to what they make it from 
because they get it back and they have to decide what to do with it. Uh, right now, they in the linear economy, they can just throw things away and not think about it and just want to sell me the next one. So we'll come back and talk about the uh, the sharing economy in a little bit. I, I want to start with you, Lorena, and um, obviously we are, we're here in, in Colombia, and you relatively recently had a new circular economy uh, plan for the country from the government. Um, I think that's a, a good sign that uh, there, there, there will be some incentives coming to help move uh, Colombia into a more circular uh, place. And uh, so maybe you could just start the conversation by telling us a little bit about those, uh, you know, that, that new, new regulations and, and uh, guidelines that have come into place. Yes, uh, the economy in Croatia is we are the national study for the circular economy. Um, and this morning we had uh, someone from the government uh, to tell us our, about this, uh, this plan. And they are doing right now hard work to collect information uh, about what the companies are doing on circular economy, but not only in the big cities, but all, uh, also in uh, small cities of the country. So they are trying to to identify the needs of these uh, companies to implement circular economy models. And one of the one of the pillars of the strategy is to to start financing um, to promote uh, innovations uh, with entrepreneurs and SMEs uh, around circular economy. So they are uh, trying to identify which are the best mechanisms to achieve uh, this, to, to support these uh, companies. Also, this morning we could uh, listen uh, from um, someone who is supporting a. Uh, a uh, pilot project from 20 companies in Colombia who are implementing circular economy models. And she told us that um, they need like, um, they need, uh, ins they need labs, they need a place where they can experiment and they can uh, do prototypes and this kind of, of, of uh, tests uh, for circular economy innovations. But uh, the country in the moment doesn't have this, um, capacities. But, but the good thing is that the government is working on that. They are in the, in identifying the needs and they are they will uh, propose um, they will propose soon uh, a framework to support these um, initiatives uh, for the businesses. And of course you, you have um, innovation hubs beginning to appear in, in cities. Um, here in Medellin, you have a couple of innovation hubs. You have a, a lot of entrepreneurial activity here in Medellin, and I think um, that's a good sign. You're going to see a lot more, you know, a lot more startups, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think everything is a good sign because uh, we are not left behind. Um, as many people have said uh, during these two days, Colombia is leading the way to go towards a circular economy in the region. And I think we need to start with something, and then start. To, you also told us yesterday that everything is a continuous, continuous um, improvement, and so we 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 need to start, and then to see how we can make better the, the things. But so it's very exciting that Colombia is leading the, the way towards circular economy. So let's talk for a few minutes about about blockchain. I think it's um, it's become a little bit of a buzzword. Um, a lot of people probably know it only from Bitcoin, um, but don't appreciate that the underlying system has many more applications. Um, Nicolas, perhaps you could just give us a short introduction to to the blockchain as if we didn't know anything, and then that, then ex explain a little bit how the blockchain can be applied in this context of circular economy. Sure, sure, Ken. So I'll start with. Uh um, Mark Andreessen's uh, quote saying that Mark, Mark Andreessen is uh, the creator of the web browser, mm -hmm. one of the creators, and he actually says blockchain tech is the first thing like the internet since the internet. So what is really happening here is that we have Web.1, which is economy of information. We have Web.2, which, which is economy of platforms, and then we come to um, web point three, which is actually economy of tokens, and which is was um, blockchain is enabling. 
So blockchain is a decentralized database, a public ledger, in which it creates a basically um, a way in which different parties can connect and do transactions or share information without necessarily uh, trusting. So it's uh, it's enabling trust in in an international uh, international way. So some of the principal characteristics of blockchain are provenance, uh, consensus, immutability, and high availability. The um, first bl blockchain is actually Bitcoin's blockchain, but, but right now we have thousands of blockchains and all of them can have different uh, approaches. More, some are more concentrated on on security, some more on decentralization. Um, so it, they're basically just experimenting so much things right now. And, and this is thanks to free open software. Free open software has enable, enables society to just um, innovate at a higher and a faster pace. We are just going to this uh, really amazing revolution and an important thing is that we went to a fundamentally from exchanging just data to exchanging value. And that's uh, something really important. And so within the blockchain, if I understand it correctly in, in my simplistic way, um, each block is connected to the next block and each one validates the next one. And so this is the mutability and how you get this security piece that if, if the next blockchain isn't validate it, yes. then so, there's clearly something wrong. Yeah, so so there is this uh, algorithm um, consensus algorithm and there is um, this, uh, so the technologies that, let's, let's talk about Bitcoin for a while because mm -hmm. it's like a really good example. And Bitcoin uh, is actually created by this uh, technology. So it's peer-to-peer -peer technology to, for people to understand better peer-to-peer -peer technology, let's think about uh, Casa or Ares or Napster, in which we used to just share music from peer to peer. There, there was no server in between. So th this, this is like the peer to peer concept. Um, then this consensus. Um, so before blockchain, there was no real way to to get a general consensus about something. This was actually this actually called the Byzantine. This the general the problem of the general of the Byzantine general, um, and with blockchain it was actually solved. This was actually solved, and w the other characteristic is immutability, it, and it's basically what you're talking about, Ken, about the the blocks. The blocks are connected cryptographically, so um, for example, in Bitcoin's case, every ten minutes um, there are uh, some supply of bitcoins that are created and these are create are created and uh, so like basically it depends on 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 who um gets the nonce the number only used once so right now there are a bunch of um we call them miners mm -hmm. and these miners are putting um hardware they are consuming electricity and what they're doing is that they're trying to solve this cryptographic, cryptographic uh, number called number only used once. Once they find it, um, all the network has to valid validate this is the right number, and this miner gets the reward. So, so that's why they're incentive. And this to, is the to, hashing. Yeah, and, and, the, so, and the hashing is really the one that solves the problem the first. The, the exactly. Problem. Whoever uh, solves this, it this first. This validates that set of transactions within that block. Exactly, exactly. So can we take a break for a minute? And sure. I think the technology system is back up again. Okay. And I'm going to invite uh, Gar Punnett from uh, Ripley in Chicago to join us. Gar, are you with us? Yes, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you perfectly, thank you. If we could bring up the, um, the Zoom web screen <coughs> of Gar. And Gar, I'm going to throw it straight over to you to do a demonstration of our new platform. Um, essentially, we're launching today a new platform here in Medellin, uh, an asset-changing platform, asset-sharing platform. 
so that businesses within uh, Medellin can be connected and can post things that they have, assets that they have that they no longer have a need for, or that they are not utilizing fully um, and that they can get value from by offering them for other users in the city to use. Um, so with that short introduction, Gar, I know your time is, is, is limited. Uh, why don't you give us a demonstration of the platform and uh, uh, show us what it's like for a user when they first sign on? Absolutely. So when a user first signs up, um, they're going to be prompted to create their profile. Um, and what's so important about what we're building here at Reaply is really connecting the right people to the right stuff at the right time. Um, whether it's assets or materials, um, it's, it's all about making sure that you're connecting with our network and connecting with the community members um, locally. And so when you're creating a profile, I'm going to take you quickly there and let me know if you can see this or can't yeah, see this. See um, but I'm going to take you to the profile. And this is where when you first sign up, uh, you'll be prompted, you'll get an email, it will say, hey, let's sign up. And it will take you to this profile section where you'll put in your picture, you might put in your name, um, <clears throat> it might be either some sort of role or what you are doing at, at whichever organization you're a part of. Uh, the, um, you know, your own business. Um, and this is where then you might add a little bit of bio about what you are about, what you're, what you're looking for, what, who you want to connect with. Um, this is where you will then be prompted to fill out, fill out different skills and proficiencies, really trying to make sure that, you know, those that are looking at your profile can get to know who you are and really trying to understand what you want or are looking for through our platform. Um, what's uh, critically important to any user that is first joining Reaply is I'm going to take you back to our home page. When you are first prompted to sign up as a user, you are going to be told um, to select your interests. And so these, this interest section is our first um, <clears throat> uh, ability uh, for our algorithm to start sorting out who's looking for what and why. So this is an opportunity for you as a user and a new, a new user of Reaply in your community to connect with um, you know, the items that might be posted under car electronics might be posted under TV and video and audio. Um, you could also look under different manufacturing or industrial assets. Um, so you'll do this by clicking yes or no. You can even go in and click through and say, you know what, I'm only interested in certain aspects of this um, asset or of these materials. Um, and if, you know, if this is something that you guys are interested in, you can then, you know, say yes or no on on certain assets and materials, but also you can also put in your custom tags. So you might be able to put in um, listings um, under something that you might be looking for that isn't listed previously in the other categories. And this is actually language agnostic. So you can maybe even use uh, Spanish, Spanish listings, um, something that you might uh, be able to just say, hey, if anybody puts this type of word into the, um, into the search or category function, um, they you'll be connected to that person with that similar listing um, through this custom tag function and so this is a way that we can then once you know through the the user's preferences once an item gets posted that then you say you are interested in you are able then to be immediately connected through email or be connected through our notifications here and so this is an opportunity where you can go to your notifications you can say oh all of these have been made or either um, I've been connected to these offers or they've been made to me um, about items that I've either posted or I've been interested in. Um, and so from here, I'm going to take you to the homepage um, where you get a kind of a brief understanding of what Reaply looks like um, as, as a whole. Um, from here, you've got a couple options. So these are our main modules here. It is, one of our modules is listings, rentals, and requests. Um, listings is anything that you are giving up to the community to either um, sell, trade, borrow, um, whatever it might be. Uh, you might be uh, hoping to, you know, have somebody take something away from your location. Um, so this can be anything. I mean, this is our demo site. So this is an example of things that we see um, on other uh, clients' uh, AXM platforms. Um, so this is where we can really take a look and you can kind of scroll through and these are all um, uh, categorized to my preferences, um, but they might look completely different for somebody who's more interested in just electrical equipment, might just be more interested in cars or uh, manufacturing equipment. So you're, so um, you're seeing their posts from 
as if as, as if in our new network you'd be seeing them from many different people many different businesses across the whole city exactly exactly and you'd be being connected to them in a very efficient organized way where it was according to what you were finding of interest on this platform it wouldn't just be um, everything on the platform it would be everything focused towards you um, one of the the other uh, feature is also uh, rentals so rentals is the same thing you'd be connected to things that uh, you have already signified would be of interest to you and so uh, from here, you can find anything from research equipment to um, any sorts of, uh, right here we've got a robotic arm to um, agricultural uh, product equipment, and so stuff to make cheese or butter or you know anything that somebody might find of interest renting to their colleagues or renting to their community members, you would find on rentals as well. And so this is, would be an opportunity for you to rent things out or get things or rent things from community members. And it would look a lot like this. You would go so to... I, so, so, I, so I would post something. something. I would post something, something if, I want, if I had something myself. And it leads me through um, a series of screens where I add a picture, add a description, say where it's available from. Yes, and that would look a lot like this. So you would check availability here. You could then look for these items. And this would all be pre-built through our workflow on how to create a function or how to create a post. And so this create a post section is where you would, as a user, um, be able to uh, create this listing or this rental or request. And a request is actually the opposite of a listing. It's just something that you're looking for from the community. And so... From here, you'd be able to put in a title. It could be anything you might be looking for. So I might be looking for a um, some sort of car part, and I'll just leave it vague. Um, and from here, I would then choose that category. I would go to um, it could be motors, and I would look for a part, you know, a vehicle, and then um, some sort of cars and trucks um, or other vehicles. Let's just do that. Um, and so this is an opportunity then, this is where you start to fill in the necessary categories to make sure that you're connecting to the right. And pop, pop back to the home stream, pop back to pop the home screen for a second and explain the numbers at the top. I know we have what we call gamification built in. Uh, tell us about the numbers at the top. top. Yes, so this is an opportunity for you to keep track of your posts, um, how many posts you're making, how many offers that you've uh, accepted, um, and sort of your, your rank in the community. We've, we've built this and we've gamified this where um, you are able to uh, you know, make these, every time you make an offer or you accept an offer and you start really uh, building up your trade volume in this platform, we keep track of all those points. And we've built in this gamification setting because we really wanted it to make it, uh, uh, build in a competitive effort here on, on, because it's not just about the competition, it really does become about re-educating people on material reuse because people start to question, oh, what is, you know, what is this person doing that I'm not doing in my everyday or how I'm thinking in my everyday and how could I get more out of this platform because I see that this person is actually getting more points. And so this is actually a re-education tool on trying to get people to understand um, how to value things differently in their community. And we can make we can, it a little bit of fun too and maybe give some rewards once in a while and say, hey, you know, Guy, you're the number one on our platform. Uh, here, here's a voucher for five dollars or I don't know what you know we can invent invent something just to promote exactly no exactly we can we give away rewards and and so this is an opportunity um, for every once in a while for us to acknowledge the people that are really using the platform and really trying to make sure that um, this is getting somewhere and that we're we're reusing this material within our communities um, so with that I wanted to take a quick look at you know when you make a when you make a post on an offer you can actually go to messages um, and this is an opportunity where you can connect with your community members for those offers. Um, so if I were to make an offer here, I would go to listings. I would make an offer on this type of uh, workstation. I would go ahead and go through the workflow here on making this happen. I would add a little note and said, hey, I am very interested. Um, and I would go ahead and make an offer, which would generate a Reaply receipt here. Um, and then I could go ahead and communicate with this person um, via this in-app messaging feature, um, where then we can now talk about this item, we could coordinate the logistics around this item, but then also we could just connect. And we've seen a lot of people connect 
with their colleagues and community members through this platform. And so that's, you know, that's really ultimately the most important part is connecting people. Terrific. Well, Gar, I thank you very much for hanging on here through our technical difficulties and showing us the, the new platform. Um, we'll be putting out more information here in Medellin to businesses through Camera Comercio and um, inviting more, more businesses, more people to join the platform and, and build it out because obviously its value grows with the size of the network. Um, thank you very much for being with us on our live stream today, Gar. And um, I'm sorry we, we messed up your Thanksgiving a little bit yesterday, and I ho hope you'll bear with us. This is good. No, we're very excited about this, and, um, and this is an exciting opportunity for really us to get also feedback from the community. So please reach out to uh, us at Reaply. Um, we want to learn more. We want to grow, and we're trying to really help push the circular economy through our effort. Um, so we appreciate any feedback. We appreciate also everybody giving a try, signing up, and really trying to scale reuse in your community. So thank you, Ken. Thank yeah, you all so much. Thank you very much. And, um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Gar. So I, I guess, um, Nicholas, that was an example of Web 2.0. Right? It's, it's, the, the, it's the next generation on from Web 1.0, and it adds value in its way. But yeah. to, to bring us back to the conversation we were having, uh, let's transition now to talk about blockchain and how it's, how it's then with these characteristics that it has for transparency and immutability, the, the, the different elements you mentioned earlier. How do we make use of that in the context of a circular economy? Sure. So, so one of the um, most important things in which blockchain can actually help uh, is supply chain. Uh, in supply chain, there is a lot of information management, there is capital management, and there, there is, of course, material management. So normally, a product has its life cycle, and at the end of the life cycle, the product just gets thrown away, like like you said, you can't. And with blockchain, what we can actually do is that we can put um, these RFID chips and we can scan them. And the person that is going to throw it away can actually share information about what are the elements that compose this product. So if you think about it, if we start to create uh, like digital passports for every um, product that that's really helpful from the inception of the product uh, when it's not even a product it's just a bunch of elements when it's passing through different uh, parts of the of the supply chain we can actually add more information to it mm -hmm. and ensure that this information is shared with all of the um, other companies that can be interested. So at the end of the life cycle of this product, there is actually going to be someone that wants this product because they know what material do they have. And with blockchain, we can now share this information. One of the biggest problems that we still have uh, in this era is that there are, there are these um, data silos, like mm -hmm. information, I have my database, you have your database, everyone, all the companies have private databases. They don't share databases because it's their database and they, the it's private. Database. Yeah, exactly. Maybe, I mean, it, it's, it's something we're used to it, but with blockchain, we can now uh, create some standards in which we can create a shared database, a database in which we can all get value, and of course, in which we can help improve uh, the material process of these products. So yesterday I saw a video uh, about um, organic cotton and tra the traceability of organic cotton. Yes. And this might be the, a sort of thing that you could apply this to where one part of, right at the beginning of that supply chain, someone has some cotton and then it has to be made into a thread and then the thread is perhaps dyed and then the dye is taken to somewhere where it's woven into a t-shirt yeah. and so at each different stage different things are happening but maybe you don't know uh, whether it was 100 percent organic cotton from the beginning uh, and that maybe somewhere along the supply chain someone tried to cheat yeah. and they tried to bring some non-organic cotton in to save them some money but cheating you you think you have a 100 percent uh, cotton 
garment, but really you only have 70% because they cheated and put something else in. This would be a way in which you can yes. keep these pieces separate and, uh, and, and intact throughout the supply yeah. chain. Yes. At least it can keep all of the supply chain or, or all of the entities that are part of the supply chain aware of where is the product and um, ho how many products are the origin but it's not it's not perfect yet in in a, the sense that if in the beginning of the creation of the product the the part is um, doesn't have good intentions I, wa I want to cheat mm -hmm. let's say they they say they took this wood from a I don't know, spe special place, but they just took it from a place they, they weren't supposed to. If there is no an auditor that can actually see where they took the wood from, then they can just put um, that information in the into the blockchain, and it doesn't necessarily is going to be true. They're just putting fake information into the blockchain. So, so that's why it's still not perfect in that sense, because we need to uh, create more trust and and understand what are the key points when the information is going to input the blockchain we we need to understand that that information is key and the information that get there has to be be trustful so it's almost like the diary of, of the the movement of the parts exactly um, in the video that i was i was watching uh, they were they were talking about the idea of adding a ceramic material which had particular light scattering uh, qualities so that with a, a handheld spectrometer, you could check whether that material was in the the wool, uh, the, the cotton. So if you add it right at the beginning when the cotton is first made, you can see if it's in the yarn when it's spun. You can see if it's still in the garment after it's made. And so maybe the combination of the two, having the blockchain as the way we share and manage the, the data, but have these other technologies that are part of that data stream. Exactly. Um, you can get a better combination. Yes. I Internet of Things is also going to help improve this uh, blockchain uh, shared databases to, to improve the supply chain um, process. So, Octavio, let's um, add you into a conversation here. Um, <laughs> Tell us about what you've been doing, and and you know this this whole question of finances and how we how we get this circular economy implementation going. This is one of my big uh -huh. yeah, topics sure. right now is to not only talk about yeah well the topic but uh, do it yeah like that's what we've been doing for the last five years at Valopes. Uh, basically, what we have been focusing on is on developing um, cloud-based platforms so that companies that in a certain way consume natural resources and generate um, let's say waste streams and products could actually trace down in an agile agile way, way how much uh, they're generating and as well how much they're consuming regarding um, water consumption by source uh, energy consumption by source and so on and so forth um, with the main um, objective of, of not only allowing them to understand in real time what's happening in each of their sites, manufacturing sites or uh, distribution centers or even administration centers, but as well to um, provide them the capacity to uh, take um, in a certain way uh, data-driven decisions on, on how they can actually improve in an economic way their performance because if they reduce the amount of waste or they identify that there are some waste streams that now they they're uh, expending money to final disposition but they could actually be uh, replacing raw material throughout industrial symbiosis processes so they were getting earning so it's a bit of what we have been working uh, for the last years uh, as well, we have a focus on not allow, not only allowing companies that consume and generate waste to uh, trace down this data and take better better decisions, but as well, companies that are focusing on being the middleman in a certain way, which are really important, that are the waste managers, industrial waste managers. So as well, we have developed a solution for them so that they can actually um, collect the data sets at the clients where they are collecting their waste and they're defining which is the type of process that it's being 
going through for uh, in order to gain traceability, traceability, and as well, as well understanding uh, if there are opportunities uh, of uh, economic scale in the future to generate new facilities that can actually start um, processing this type of uh, resources that so maybe, sometimes end up at landfills or yeah, maybe incinerators. Maybe they were working a little bit in the dark that they didn't even know yeah. what their own waste were, right? Yeah, yeah. And, or, or maybe they, they, they know, but they know it. Uh, like, for example, what has happened with uh, the big companies, companies that have several uh, manufacturing sites in, 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 in the country, yeah, all of them, they have to send this information to the authorities uh, in order to uh, have the capacity to operate. Uh, but each, com each uh, manufacturing site does it in a separate way with their own format. So it's all about something of a more, a more yeah, standardized, standardization of the information, of the categorization. Uh, and as well, practices, good practices, because sometimes they're like in silos. Each uh, manufacturing, so even, though it's, even though it's in one company, yeah, yeah the different parts of the organization don't necessarily yeah, all do the best yeah, practice. Yeah, and this is not because of they don't want to do it, just because they're like focusing on their daily work and they don't have like a, the capacity or the right tool sets that allows them to share this, this info. And that's so, what so, we have been So your, your working work is around. really helping companies with their existing flows to manage them more effectively. Exactly. And that we're focusing on environmental flows, but as well allowing them not only to trace down uh, how, how much is it, but as well uh, the economic flows related to those uh, environmental flows. And can you give us a sense of the results? Are, are, are there savings, cost yeah. savings that people are seeing? Incomes. There are opportunities of incomes even though. But it's quite a, uh, interesting because um, what happens is that they understand this companies start understanding that maybe, I don't know, in the northern part of Colombia, in the Caribbean coast, uh, there is a huge opportunity for certain types of materials that sometimes are just being thrown away. But here in Antioquia, they're already uh, recycling or reutilizing. So that's kind of the things that they start figuring out, that, that they actually can even earn money, not, not only save it. So that's a bit of uh, like the first stage. Uh, we have been able to accomplish. Uh, and as well, um, since that point ahead, what we're trying to work is to uh, generate this traceability in real time. So connecting the different actors of the value chain that we have been developing solutions for them so that the data could actually be shared. Let's say at the beginning, uh, what we, when we started in 2015, we were like, yeah, we should start with blockchain, of course. Uh, this is like, uh, let's say, a really interesting solution, but was not the problem we had to focus on solve. But yeah, uh, I agree with a lot of things that Nicolas have said about how blockchain can actually allow to have this uh, traceability and ensure it. Uh, but let's say that in our case, we're more focused on solving their problems and then trying to move towards providing better continuous, solutions. Continuous improvement. Exactly. exactly. Bring in the new technologies yeah, alongside what yeah, you're already like, doing. For example, one of the things that we're starting to move through is to IoT. Start to mm -hmm. uh, not only use mobile apps, but as well trying to figure out other type of solutions that allows company to have even uh, real-time data continuously and not uh, not synchronized but an app. Even on the platform that we were just launching a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. you know, there's an opportunity there for a company that identifies that they have something that may have some value, but they don't know what to do with yeah. it. Yeah. So that's the sort of thing you could easily post on yeah. the forum like this yeah. so and, and see who else in, the, in, in your locality yeah. uh, might and, have and a use, use for that. So that's another thing that we have been working like that's the main purpose of Balop is how to recover value from um, resources that are underutilized and that ends up at, at landfills or incinerated or in uh, security, yeah, like secure underground. It's with this info actually start developing the dynamics that allows uh, manufacturing sites to replace raw material by secondary raw material. Uh, and that's like the next stage we have to move towards and we're like already designing for 
with all the data that we have been gaining from the industry. Mm -hmm. well, Lorena, when we have been working here in Medellin with Sura and uh, the National Reclamation Center for, for Vehicles, yeah. um, you know, we run into this problem that they are trying their best to make a circular economy, um, but the product that they're dealing with, the, the automobile, was never designed for a circular economy. And so they can't really deconstruct it in order to get value back from any any mechanism, whether it's with or without a blockchain or any any, any at all. A any insights from that from that work about um, you know how, how we can better value things? Do do we just have to go back to the beginning again and say, hey, this is just one of those cases where we have to redesign the vehicle. If you're going to be in the circular economy, you can't make your vehicle the way you did in the past. What do you think? Well, this is a special case because because um, what happens is that Sura is doing like, the work at the end of the supply chain. When a car is uh, designed in Europe, maybe, and is built um, in many parts of the world, all the parts of a car, and then it's just uh, put together all the parts here in Colombia and is sold. And then with, when it's scratched, Sura is trying to recover the most of, the, of it. Uh, but the car is, wasn't designed here. So it's uh, a complex supply chain. And for Sura, it's difficult to know. They have seeds. For them, it's difficult to know which kind of textile is this. I don't know what to do with this. And they are trying to sell this, but they don't know what, it, what this, but, but which material is this. So I think with this technology, blockchain, and all these new trends, we can enable this kind of, of models. Yeah, it's a, um, a multi-layered problem, isn't it? Is that one problem with the seats is that they take the fabric that we're sitting on the outside yeah. and they glue it to the foam, which gives us the cushion. Yeah. And so we can't get the, the, the seat cover from the, yeah, from the it foam it anymore. It takes a lot of time. It is just um, a waste of time to just take it off. And it, it takes a process. And we have to make it easier. We have to redesign the mechanisms in which we create these products. But then you could have the tra traceability of saying, oh, you're using a Renault whatever brand. And in that, you know that there are 5,000 parts and they're all there in the blockchain. Yeah. And you, you could know exactly what the materials are with yeah. the material passport idea. Yeah. There will be actually be um, companies that will be waiting for the for the product to get its the end of the life cycle to just take it and take the parts they need. So it's a different uh, design mechanism which will create incentives for companies to just take waste. Yeah. And another thing is that Sura is at the end of the supply chain, but they can do something and what they are doing now is approaching the manufacturers to tell them, we are trying to recover the most of the vehicles you are selling but we can do it because these materials were not designed for a circular economy. So I think Sura is doing a great, great work here in Colombia. Um, yeah, so I they agree. Are, I, I agree. That in the, even within the linear context, they're doing a terrific job. They they yeah. they get absolutely every piece of value they can from the vehicle. And companies are, are starting to change the mindset. They're going to, from selling products to just servi serviceification. Uh, one like really good example is Rolls Royce. They actually they make the engines for for airplanes, yeah. and they they just stop uh, selling them and they and they just start to rent them by hour. Yeah. So it it really improves uh, the client. For example, clients don't have to invest in something. They just I'll use it for an hour. I'll pay for an hour, yeah. and they're focused on creating high quality quality products and not products that have this program obsolescence mm -hmm. like in 10 years the product is just doesn't work now they're focused on on quality products and they actually will do the maintenance of the product so it's like a win-win situation and most important we don't have to create and create more more products we just get the use to see that a little bit this the same idea the same concept even coming into the home with the laundry that why would you buy a washing machine? You can buy a wash, yeah. and then it, it, you don't have to own the washing machine. 
but you can say, hey, yes, I want to wash my clothes three times a week, once a week, but whatever it is, and you only pay per wash. It's like bringing the laundromat inside your home. Exactly. Is for example, if you need to make a hole in the wall, uh, normally people just just go and buy this thing and to make holes in the wall. Hey, why don't you just rent so, or someone that gives the service to just make a hole in the wall? Mm -hmm. Just going from products to services. Yeah. And then again, in the tool that we were we were seeing launch today, um, services can be on that platform just as much as a material or product can be. Yeah. Uh, so what other examples do we have around the table of some of these different changes in finances? How can we, you know, we have to get this implementation piece going faster because we don't have a lot of time. I said yesterday that we've already spent 32 years on sustainable development and we're still unsustainable. Not because we've not been trying, but it's just we've not been coming at it from the right direction. And so now coming at it from the circular economy direction and these different models, we can, we can maybe have more success. And any other thoughts or ideas to, to add to the conversation? Well, in our case, let, let's say we, we have got some funding and grants from governments before, like let's, uh, not because of circular economy, but because we have been developing uh, innovations regarding uh, digitalization in digital products. Um, so for what you were saying before regarding the new package or the new circular economy strategy of Colombia, this will be starting opening doors for new opportunities as well with Colombia Productiva. Uh, I know as well in Chile, they have like some circular economy initiatives to finance uh, as well, uh, entrepreneurs that are starting with solutions that are physical solutions or as well digital solutions. But uh, at the end, in our experience, uh, the ones that actually have to, uh, in a certain way, push for this are companies. So our focus has been to being able to provide a good service, a good platform, and sell it to the companies. So, well, so far we've been able to work with Coca-Cola FEMSA, with Costa On, you know, look some pilots with Unilever, with Corona, and other big companies here. And those are the ones that have to, you know, start innovating their own processes and pushing up these these things because if even though public policy it's really important because it provides a framework if the industry doesn't you know start pushing around uh, and try to you know uh, tell policymakers that we are here we can do it but come on let's work together the transition will be slow uh, that's like yeah. my, my, my humble the, opinion. The idea, like you said, with Rolls Royce and with the, with the laundry, <laughs> it takes a different way of looking at finance than the traditional one because somebody still has to finance the engine. If you're not buying it and paying for it up front, it's going to have to be paid for over a much longer time period through the use cycle. So if you're only paying every hour, Rolls Royce only gets one hour pay, one hour pay, one hour pay. And so exactly. it changes the, the relationship with the bank. Exactly. You actually have more cash flow. You just, exactly. So it's it improves in many ways. Uh, another example I recently saw. So recently they opened this uh, big H&M store here in Medellin. And they, they were actually um, giving this information that you can take your clothes to them. Uh, all clothes. It doesn't have to be H&M clothes. And th they will actually give you some credits to to discount for to buy their clothes. Mm -hmm. So th I, th I think this is like a really le um, leadership in, in this aspect. And I, I think we have to value this kind of things more. Uh, another thing is that the concept circular economy is not yet uh, as known. Uh, you ask a lot of people about circular economy, they have an idea, but they don't really know what it is. So there is a lot more education to be done. Sure. Another thing that is important and more for the context of the Americas or maybe South America is that circular economy has to be supported by innovation. And during my, my, during my, my master dissertation, I did like a, a study uh, researching how is uh, my country, Colombia, uh, in innovation. And the, the reality is that companies don't invest uh, in innovation, neither the government. So if we don't invest in innovation, we are not going to get the solutions we need for a circular economy. So I think it's one important point that we need to have in mind 
because for me, a circular economy is only possible through innovation. <laughs> through innovation. So it's very, very important to invest in innovation and that companies see this as an investment, not as a expense. Yeah. Because yeah. Many, and I think, and I think you, you know, across the whole region, we have to begin the transition from being at the, the very bottom end of the supply chain, where you're focusing on minerals and extraction, which is where traditionally your economies have been, and begin to move you know, up higher up the value chain exactly. within, that, uh, within that chain. Yeah. And hopefully some of these new technologies, and I think particularly you know, we have a session later after us, I think, on education. I think this is so important. It's not. It's education at multiple levels, right? It's educating people in general, because how would people today react to the idea of buying one wash yeah. <laughs> instead of buying a washing machine? It's it's outside of most people's normal thinking. Exactly. So this is this is a consumer behavior question. This is one part of education, right? And then the other is fundamentally at the university level. I've done a lot of. Um, Teaching, you know, here in uh, in Medellin in, in Bogota, and I think there is a need to not only put these ideas in the curriculum, but I've been spending time with uh, the uh, the administration, with the deans, and with the with the rectors, and saying, look, you need this is how you need to operate your university. So when a student comes onto the campus, the only way that uh, they they experience their education is in a circular way. The circularity is all around them. It's not only I'm getting taught circular economy 101 next Wednesday. Exactly. So I think it's an experiential thing as well yeah. as a curriculum piece. I think uh, right now a circular economy is like entrepreneurial economy. Um, who introduces circular economy? Entrepreneurs. Uh, go governments have not at least in Latin America, they have not seen how they can make value yet. Entrepreneurs are creating their own companies and actually teaching governments, hey, we, we can help you with this and you can improve this in many ways and this in many ways. Yeah, I agree. It's like the, the things you are thinking about with blockchain, the new technology we're bringing with the platform we just launched. These are things that are coming new from new organizations, not from not from existing structures. Yeah. And I think it's important to have in mind, just remind, remind me, uh, the value of that, because entrepreneurs are, have great ideas. And they are working on these ideas, but they need the support to, to, to bring these ideas to the market. So governments, I think the government has a very huge role to support the, these entrepreneurs to don't fall, fall in the value of debt, and they can, they can, yeah, yeah, as you as you did, I, you, I, got I, the, well, you got the you got the experience. You live this. Completely understand what it's that like. Sometimes you are not able to get funding, um, not because there is not resources, but maybe because of the funding is not well structured. So they give you some resources, but then you have to spend them with certain type of uh, for service providers, but they're not maybe the ones or the type of service you require to grow or to establish and so on and so forth. So it, yeah, yeah I think right sense. now government or should help a lot more entrepreneurs or at least don't get in the way of an entrepreneur. I mean, and, and that's um, like a big thing right now. Um, in, blockchain can enable also crowdfunding. This is what we know as uh, ICOs, in, initial coin offerings. Um, and they're actually called initial coin offerings and not security token offerings at the beginning because they wanted to do a crowdfunding and they just wanted to do it for everyone so everyone in the world can invest. This is the, the best example of this is Ethereum, mm -hmm. uh, which is a um, uh, Turing complete uh, blockchain and in which ena it enables smart contracts and they're building uh, decentralized applications on it. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs that make initial coin offerings and get um, create their own coin and get uh, money, get funding uh, to develop their, their, their project. And this is a really innovative way. But now some governments are getting in the way and are saying, okay, but you're not really selling an utility token. You're actually selling a, a security token, 
and we're going to have to regulate you, and we're going to have to put this middleman and this middleman and this middle here, and it's just uh, uh, it's just having an uh, like a, a beautiful technology as blockchain that it can enable us to do so many things in in improving ways, and then government just wants to put some more and more middlemen in the way. It's just not getting the whole the whole potential out of it. Isn't part of that their fear that they're out of they're completely out of that loop, that the government has no control. Yeah. So it's it's, it's it, possibly it, more a defensive reaction than anything else. It's true, absolutely. Um, for with the Bitcoin government cannot regulate it. It's just no. impossible. It's totally decentralized, and that, that's the beauty of it. And they should just accept it and embrace it as fast as possible. Because the the faster they embrace it, the the, the better they'll be to compete with other other countries. Well, that brings in another topic, which is risk, right? Because I mean, entrepreneurs are more able to take on risk. This is part of the role of the entrepreneur is you're trying something new that hasn't been done before and you're taking on some risk in doing this this is part of your profile as an entrepreneur um, but yet you know not not every organization uh, can tolerate that risk so that's another another reason why this is a new pool of, of talent with a different sensibility that can work on some of these these topics and also you have what more than seventy percent of businesses in in Colombia here are small and medium sized enterprises. Yeah. So again, it's how do we how do we activate that network, which is many businesses each in, in each individual city. Um, and I don't know that we have the the tools yet to really bring everybody to the to the table. Well, I don't know, let, let, let's say Impulsa, which is. Uh government institution mm -hmm. that's the one that has been leading this I'll say for over 10 years maybe maybe more uh, I mean I think they have done a great effort still tons of things to improve but uh, what is most important is that uh, maybe and, and this could happen with a strategy in the circular economy that they focus resources for entrepreneurs in the circular economy mm -hmm. because let's say Impulsa works with uh, Impulse is working with um, entrepreneurs that are working on the digital world, but for for solutions for any type of uh, industry or verticals. Um, and then uh, there is something starting to happen, maybe since two or three years, maybe longer, which are the accelerator accelerators owned by companies. So let's say you know Grupo Corona has one. I have heard that FEMS as well has one in Mexico and like companies are understanding that the way of actually innovating is to uh, sharing some of their challenges and like uh, bringing along the community of entrepreneurs to see if they can have something. They call them hackathons. Hackathons, yeah. yeah. But, just... but these are more even more structures like, yeah. Yeah, because they're already trying to find a solution that might be in a prototype uh, version. I know like um, in, in Bogota it's um, co uh, Connect Bogota, here it's Ruta N, uh, th those are other like more regional institutions that are working and universities are starting as well to yes, generate you know, these yeah, AFIT yeah, here yeah, in, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in Bogota. I know that EAN, EAN has like a really yep. Strong one, one in also, sustainability. Yeah, there's issues. one also now in just uh, starting in um, Javeriana, El Bosque. El Bosque as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so there are some of them that are yeah. actually well starting uh, to focus on. Yeah, they're, they're, they're small and they're sort of city, city level, city funded. Mm -hmm. But I think so far, from what I've seen, they're mainly giving entrepreneurs help with the traditional business help, uh, like marketing or finance. Yeah. Um, which is needed, you know, not all entrepreneurs uh, have these other skill sets that they need to create a viable company. But we, we probably, I think, need an, another injection into that list. We need, we need circular economy people who understand the things we've been talking about for the last two days. So that they're, yes, they're learning finance, yes, they're learning marketing, uh, but they also need to build this in uh, as the next generation yeah. work. There is another thing that I don't know how it's starting here to be a trend in the region, not only in Colombia, which are uh, social impact or impact funds. 
they're like uh, ventures, or yeah. VC firms, or other type of uh, finance organization, which are trying to, um, yeah, like inject money in startups or companies which actually have a social or environmental yeah. impact. And uh, I think in the impact, last session, impact yeah, 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 impact yeah. investing. Yeah. Yeah. In the last session, there was um, Federico yeah. from the Impact Copies running yeah. the Accelerate 2030 program here in Colombia, which focus on uh, trying to help companies that are impacting directly with uh, one of the OD, uh, yeah, like the objectives of sustainability development, ODS in English, uh, GDS, it's global, it's yeah, I don't remember how, what's the, AGDs, okay. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see that uh, we're moving along that because even though, um, when we are, or, or at least uh, when I talk about circular economy, I usually focus on environmental impact or resource mm -hmm. efficiency impacts. There is as well the social part, at least yeah. in the set here in Colombia yeah. and in the countries in Latin, which so this is the, context. the scavengers yeah. and you know mm -hmm. all these people that actually survive and live and, and can study even though and become uh, professionals thanks to recycling in these streets. So. That's I think image. this idea that you know we have to marry sustain the best of sustainability with circular economy, this mm -hmm. is part of what I've been teaching because just being circular on its own doesn't make you sustainable. I can think of many many different ways in which things could be brought back and reutilized, and be said to be circular, but they're not sustainable. That's right. And so I think for me, I think we have to put the word sustainable in front of circular economy. And then we don't lose what we've been doing for the past 32 years. And it also makes sure that all three years of it, we've been talking mainly about finance and economics. Yeah, economics but yeah. you mentioned then a lot of focus on environment, mm -hmm. and, but also equities in there. So when we bring sustainability back mm -hmm. in and have a sustainable circular economy, then we have to bring all three E's back into the discussion as well. So I think that's a, a nice way to tie everything together. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And I, th I think I heard Kevin yesterday or earlier today talk about two themes that he'd been uh, seeing as he moves in this circular economy world. Mm -hmm. um, one where entrepreneurs are uh, coming in with ideas almost to fix the linear economy. Oh, this, this is the problems that are coming from the linear economy. Mm -hmm. So I have an idea that can help. And that's, that's one level of which we can operate but that doesn't change the underlying linear economy. Yeah. So for me, that's more of a transitional strategy. And I think this is the other thing we have to think about is what are important transitional strategies that we can implement now that are helping, but they're not the ultimate solution. Yeah. And the second thing that Kevin talked about was what you might call true circular, where we really go back to the beginning, like you were saying, we have to do really for the car and say, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll never make a circular economy from the existing car design. Yeah. So this has to be redesigned from the beginning. Yeah. And so I think it's, it's probably a combination of everything we've been talking about these past two days that has to come together because every, every piece of the puzzle helps. Absolutely. But recognize that some of these are only interim steps or they're, they're for a short period to help while we go back and redesign. Mm. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. This is for Nicole. Mm -hmm. Because you talked about the passports for the materials. Yeah, and the digital passports. This could be enabled for um, blockchain. I wanted to ask you how advanced is this topic around the world and how well, do you see like this in Yeah, in, yeah. In um, so right now there is a platform called provenance.org. Uh, I think it's by J Jessie Baker. And she's actually one of the uh, individuals that right now is pushing this trend of. Um, blockchain in supply chain and how they're adding a lot of value to um, to products so one of the ways that products can gain more value is that if you can actually prove that you're being um, sustainable then your corporate social responsibility profile improves and it improves to all of the supply chain and the the consumers see, see, can see it they they can perceive it and they appreciate it, and we're and in a society in which we are actually more. Um, we know what's happening. I mean, we need to change. I, we need circular economy 
before was just something like oh it's, it would be nice if we do it right now i think we just we just have to do it and the next couple of years we just have to implement it so governments have to have to think more in a way that can actually create incentives to entrepreneurs and to to companies to to make the circular economy speed up because we we really need it right now and i think we have this fundamental problem i mean when i look at products that are made and the example i sometimes give is something as simple as a tennis ball i was watching uh, tennis at wimbledon in london earlier in the summer and it reminded me of some work that was done at the university of warwick in england about the tennis ball and they 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 tracked how much travel was involved in just making a simple tennis ball originally tennis balls were made in england and they only yeah. moved uh, maybe 150 kilometers from where they were made to where they played tennis at wimbledon yeah. so it was a short a short travel distance but of course with the global economy it's now moved to indonesia and yeah. so now they did the calculation and it was more than 83,000 kilometers of travel of materials 14 different yeah. journeys of materials <laughs> sometimes going back and forth and somewhere else for a different yeah. process each time just to get one tennis ball to play tennis at Wimbledon. And you know, this is perhaps no surprise when we think like this, how many miles that tennis ball had to travel. How many that, resources we have to... How many resources... You, what, this is why we have so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so much energy to move a tennis ball. And now imagine we do the same with all the billions of products that there are across the world. So we, we just have no real concept of how much energy we're using. The yeah. carbon food, footprint actually related to that. I mean, there is a study from Edward Hertwig, I don't know if you have heard from him. Mm -hmm. That's the, um, the name of it. It's Carbon Footprint of Nations, where basically he just mm -hmm. run up these uh, input and output studies. And he just traced down that some materials that are, or most of the material, uh, resources or goods that are being consumed, I don't know, let's say in Europe, are being produced in China, and yeah. the raw material that's coming from Africa yeah. or from South America or even from the States. So it's like a huge uh, yeah, the journey, is journey from all the resources and the consumption of energy interrelated. So that's when something, as you were saying before, that it's education and helping uh, the consumers to take better decisions and understand what, what's the implication of yeah. having a tennis ball being produced in China mm. and then paying a bit more for one that it's being produced, maybe not in England, but maybe, I don't know, uh, in Spain. Mm -hmm. It's better for their environment, even though yeah. they have to be, pay a bit more. And maybe that's again where big data start to come in, that right, yeah. right now we don't yeah. have the ability to, it's really to, to take this sort of information and make it consumer relevant. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. when I go to buy a tennis ball, and yeah. there are two different ones, uh, I have no way to know if the one is better uh, than the other for some dimension yeah. around sustainability or around circular yeah. economy. There, there has been, in a certain way, with um, sustainability certificates or EPD, EPDs, environmental declaration mm -hmm. products, mm -hmm. but yeah. still they're too complex. So yeah. if you haven't studied life cycle analysis or yeah. this type of tools for you, it's going to be something that doesn't say that much and doesn't allow you to take a better decision so it's but we also have the concept in europe now of buildings as a material bank so even yeah. even yeah. you know when you come to make a new building yeah. you can use that same idea of tracking and tracing mm. everything you use to make that building and you could have that on the blockchain yeah and absolutely. even if that building lasts 50 years 100 years it doesn't matter how long it it stays in its current form you know exactly what is inside that building structure mm. right from the first day to the last and it has a value steel exactly. steel will have a value 100 years from now and you can again you can use financial modeling to look at that value um, and, and use that in your calculations of well what should i be making my building from so that it's not only cost effective to make today but also that it will have a good residual value that i can track in these new ways Europe is actually one of the uh, leading, um, it's actually le leading circular economy and, and it's investing a lot in, in blockchain. I actually had the opportunity to work in a startup called FlexiDAO 
And what they did is that they're a blockchain based clean tech, clean tech startup. And they certify the consumption with the production of renewable energy. So right now, the traditional way to do is that there is something called energy attribute certificates, which companies um, every year, they just uh, show um, that they, they, are, they, ha they have consumed green energy per se. The problem with this is that they, they still go through a process. Uh, some, some of them is incredible, but still like a, they, st they still go through, a, through an Excel sheet, just putting mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. managing data through Excel sheets. And it takes so much time and it, it takes so much uh, work and it can actually be, uh, it, can ha it, can, it can pass through many mistakes. And, and what, what FlexiDAO does is that it gives transparency to this process. When the producer of uh, renewable energy uh, produces energy, it, create, it creates like this digital token with the data. Where is the, com where's the, um, where's the plant? Uh, how many um, kilowatts of energy is producing? And then at the other end, there is a corporation that wants to show that is renewable, that, that, is, that its profile is uh, corporate social responsible. So what they do is that they can actually choose what kind of energy they want to consume. They want to consume um, um, solar energy, photovoltaic energy, if they want to consume um, uh, biomass energy, if they want to consume any kind of energy, they can actually choose from which plant to consume it. Mm. And this is a really like interesting and powerful software because it actually um, empowers consumers and co corporate consumers of renewable energy to have an impact in uh, places like I want to consume energy from Idrituango. Let's say Bank Colombia wants to consume energy energy from Idrituango. They can actually choose Idrituango. Mm -hmm. They want to consume energy from another um, renewable energy plant, and th th this is starting to to pick up a lot of uh, um, yeah. esteem right now, per se. I think another thing that everyone has to remember is that these ideas we've been talking about for two days about a sustainable circular economy, in a way, are they're, in a way they're not new. Uh, we talked at the beginning about in, in economies like in Africa and originally all over the world, by necessity, we were always circular. Yeah. It's only as we've, quote unquote, ev evolved that we've changed the way we, we do things. And um, I think it's important to remember that none of these technologies, even if we're talking about solar or wind, mm -hmm. none of them have been designed with the circular economy in mind. So now we're getting to the stage where I in Europe, um, when wind turbines are coming into the second generation, they're having to take down the old turbines and they don't know what to do with them except put it in the landfill. So that, you know we've done one good thing by moving from non-renewable to renewable, but we didn't do it in a circular way. And I think this is another lesson that absolutely everything we do now, looking forward, has yeah. to be done in a sustainable circular way, as well as all these other attributes that we're trying yeah. to to bring in. So it's like a, it's across the board. This has to be done. But t tell me a little bit about the, the the use of the token. I'm interested because, mm -hmm. from what I understand. Um, the value in uh, you know, like even a cryptocurrency uh, or in a token is it's based on use, right? If, if there's no use, there's no value. So how, where does the use case come in well, in some in, of these? In the case of Bitcoin, which is the most known cryptocurrency, right now is the one who has m most value and is the more secure. Depends on which day we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. Um, so in the case of Bitcoin, there is a lot of things that give it value. First of all, scarcity. Mm -hmm. There can only be 21, 21 million. million Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And if you think about, you think about it, traditional economy, um, it's fiat currency. What we mean by fiat currency is that it's not back, back up by gold. Mm -hmm. So the dollar was um, stopped being backed up by gold since 1973 in the famous mm -hmm. Nixon shock. Mm -hmm. And, and the peso, of course, calling peso is not backed by gold. You cannot go to the bank and just, hey, Change give me it. some gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to trust. You have to trust government. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the thing is that if, you, if you're in Venezuela, if you trust the government, you're in a really bad position sure. because you can have your 100 million bolivars in your bank account, but 
you can still have them, but what do you the, buy? Yeah, but you don't have the the um, buying capacity. Buying power. It's just disappears. So decentralization and uh, open networks. Bi uh, Bitcoin is open. Bitcoin is permissionless. It means it cannot be stopped. Um, Bitcoin is. Um, I believe uh, it's borderless. You don't have to ask permission sure. to... But its value comes because it's being used, right? I mean, yeah. like you say, people in Venezuela yeah. are, are moving into Bitcoin yeah. because it has, so, even with its volatility, it's still more stable than the than their currency. So, so in my opinion, the, the value comes from, of course, what I just said, but also the social contract. Mm -hmm. We have to create this new social contract that this cryptocurrency have value. Even if you don't understand it, once you understand it, you know it has value, sure. and you know technology is powerful and disruptive, and it's going to disrupt a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and that's what's happening right now. So, with tokens, um, after B uh, Bitcoin was created, they created Ethereum. Um, um, actually, Vitalik Buterin and and others created um, Ethereum, and with Ethereum came this standard called the ER ERC20 standard which you can actually really easily create a token. So so it's really, really easy to, to create a token right now. And I can actually um, say how many tokens there can be and what are the, what are the rules, per se. But the, 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 the difficult th thing is to make people use them. Exactly. Why would I use this token? Yeah. So a great example is the BAT token, the basic attention token mm -hmm. from the Brave browser. And in, in this case, you're browsing, for example, and if you're using the Brave browser, you can actually gain tokens if you watch adver advertisement. Mm -hmm. So, th so they're creating an incentive, right, right, right there. So, mm -hmm. like, hey, you give me your attention, I'll give you some tokens. Right. So they're actually including the the user in a in a friendly way, and you can actually get this bad basic attention token. I just change it for Bitcoin and then change it for pesos. So it's money. Attention is money, and 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 tokens can represent many many things. And and this is what is happening right now. Um, we we're we're seeing that new decentralized applications are creating tokens, not only to do crowdfunding, but to be able to improve the user interface in their applications. So I think um, we only have a couple more minutes left of this session. Um, I think as soon as we're done here and we are off air and the next people are on, I think we have to go to the back room here and create our new token <laughs> for the circular economy because it seems like from what we've been discussing, we're crying out for yeah. the bringing together of all of these different things. I think we have the, the general idea of where we want to go and why we need to go, the, the, the pressing yeah. environmental problems and even financial problems across the world and the inequalities of finances. Um, so I think, you know, we want to encourage everyone who's watching on the live stream to join in with us and, you know, keep, keep in touch with us through the circular economy platform of the Americas. Um, I, I said yesterday a, a story that I had when a, um, a student at one of the universities I spoke at asked me, well, what can I do? And it is very difficult as individuals to do things. Yeah. And I, I came out with my very, very limited Spanish, and I said, Viva la Revolución. <laughs> and it was really, it was a cry from my heart to say, look, we all have to join in and do this. It's, it's not for governments to do it. It's not just for companies to do it. And it's for entrepreneurs to do it. We're, we're all doing it in, in a small way here by trying to bring everyone together at this forum. Um, I'd like to invite you all to just, you know, give a, a few final remarks and thoughts based on what we've been talking about, are you optimistic, pessimistic, and um, and then we'll close out this session. Well, um, I, I think what's needed is a systemic change, and as you said, as individual, if there is just one or a few people doing it, there's not going to be like a full structure just for a well positive, possibly for a good transition, but um, I mean, from the side of entrepreneurs, uh, I'm, 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 I am an entrepreneur. I've uh, been doing this for five years. We have to keep trying, you know, like if, they, if this is something that really, um, in a certain way, you believe in it, 
you just keep doing it until it fulfills and emerge in things that should emerge in order to so that your idea becomes a reality regarding uh, the other point uh, financing well uh, i mean there are sources of financing nowadays for entrepreneurs if you have a dig digital product uh, product or idea of a digital transformation or, or a digital solution uh, and then well uh, I, I think uh, sustainability or circular economy uh, are becoming a trend so this is the time to be working these type of issues providing real solutions and always focus that if you're developing something it must be solving something to someone more than how much money you can earn it's about yeah. the solution and the challenge and how is it to use the added value in some dimension yeah, that's exactly that's you have to right. recover value yeah well i am optimistic with um, all these new trends because i think uh, we as society we are waking up um we are aware that we need a change so we need as uh, octavio just said we need to continue working in different fields and to start embrace these new technologies to enable a circular economy. Um, I'm very optimistic because the government is waking up as well. Companies and entrepreneurs are doing their, their, their work and yeah, we just need to continue working. Yeah, absolutely. I believe circular economy will go by the hand of um, token economy. and. Uh, Shermin Boschmir, she actually the author of Token Economy, she introduces a really interesting concept called purpose-driven tokens. So purpose-driven tokens incentivize individual behavior to contribute to a collective goal. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really interesting. We just really need to align our interest and apply it. Let's say, for example, if you ride on a bicycle here in Medellin, you can get this token which can actually use, use it to transport later on the metro. It, those are some of the ideas of purpose-driven tokens. Mm -hmm. Individual does something for the collective goal. Yeah, very good. Well, I want to thank all my panelists here and Gar, uh, who was with us from Chicago earlier. If you are interested in finding out more about the new uh, asset sharing pl platform that we launched earlier today, uh, please go to circularassets.com You'll find a link down there. If you're in Medellin, you can uh, find the link to sign up for free. And then within the next 24 hours, we will invite you into the platform itself. If you're outside Medellin and watching and you're interested in having an asset sharing platform in your city, then, then let us know. Let us know through the chat. You can email us back through the Circular Economy Platform of the Americas. And we'd love to start a dialogue with you and get, get these sharing platforms going in, in every city, not only here in Colombia, but uh, everywhere else in the world where you want one. So with that, we'll say thank you very much to the panelists again. Thank and I'd you like again. to invite the uh, friends from uh, Mas Boskis to come and talk to us about uh, the uh, carbon footprint uh, offsets. Okay. Thank you again.